I'm going to start today a little out of order because the government, the Justice Department, the State Department say that there is a potential stumbling block to the U.S. lifting the terror label. And that is that there could be weapons in Camp Ashraf. And so I find this such an insult to our American men and women who stood by and certified to the United States military, to General Odierno, that there weren't any weapons. But I think we should hear from someone who was on the ground, who was in charge and wearing the uniform of the United States military, General Phillips, who was there when Ashraf was de-armed, and I think it's important to hear from him rather than hear from anybody else who may say something but don't know what's really going on. So General Phillips, would you please speak to the fact that there is no weapons on the ground? Thank you. Thank you, distinguished guests. Thank you for the opportunity to come here today and address this group. I'd also like to uh, thank those freedom-loving people who believe in a democratic Iran and the Mujahideen -e Kalk, the 3,400 members that are spread out between Camp Ashraf or confined at Camp Liberty. You've endured much during the nine years of captivity, but I'm going to take you back a little bit. I want to go back to those days following the ground invasion in 2003. The MEK, Mujahideen -e Kalk, were dispersed over dozens of locations. Many of you know this. They were not just at Camp Ashraf. They were at Basra, Talil, Fallujah, Baghdad. Camp Ashraf happened to be the facility that we consolidated them at because it was north of Baghdad in the desert area of Diyala. It was a tactical decision. Get them all at one location to where we can go through a disarming process. As they abandoned their other bases and facilities, which they put a lot of work into, overnight they were looted and vandalized. I personally went down to the Baghdad facility, which was a six-story office building, pretty much administrative. Within 24 hours of us removing the Mujahideen from that location, it was a vacant hulk, total wrecked facility. Even the windows were ripped out of their borders. I can only imagine how the mullahs laughed as we forced the MEK to consolidate at Camp Ashraf, along with all their armored vehicles, their artillery pieces, their large arms, their automatic weapons, and their small arms. We did what the Mullah regime could not do. We eliminated the military threat of the Iranian resistance. They, the MEK, voluntarily turned over all of their offensive and defensive weapons, leaving them vulnerable to the insurgents. Yes, there were insurgents in Iraq and infiltrators from the current Iranian regime. Once we had them there, I was showing several of the senior leaders what Camp Ashraf was, because it was an anomaly. It was separate from the rest of what was going on in Iraq. That's probably why they pushed it over to the military police. Let them handle it. They'll handle anything. Well, I took an Air Force uh, general officer around, and he pointed out to me, those look like high-frequency antennas. So we checked, and sure enough, they were the MEK were broadcasting into Iran. I had my Farsi-speaking linguists listen in. It was much like the voice of America. It broadcast the news, radio shows, and music. It was a cultural type station. But no, I had to turn, shut it down. I had to not only shut it down, I had to seize the equipment so it could not go back on the air. It was unfortunate because what the Iranian jammers couldn't do we did for them. We shut down that voice of hope. And simultaneously, 
in November of 03, when we supposedly never searched Camp Ashraf in its entirety, we started phase one of an operation. During this phase, we systematically searched every square kilometer of that 36 square kilometer facility simultaneously while we were taking the 3,400 members, including many Iranian Americans. While we were doing that and searching the facility, the MEK loaned us their buses so that we could transport their people off of Camp Ashraf to a facility up north to where we could do biometrics on them. This phase ended on the 13th of January, where we had DNA, retinal scans, and some of the most cutting edge technology, technological ways of identifying them. Phase two of the operation, which apparently some people don't know ever took place, commenced on the 2nd of March. It was completed on the 4th of May, where each and every member was individually interviewed off of the Camp Ashraf grounds by the FBI and multiple other U.S. agencies, including our intelligence agencies. During this phase, I was physically walking the ground of Camp Ashraf. We offered each member the opportunity to leave, and a few did. There was no barring them. They could leave. They were provided their, also their personal property and given some funds by the leadership of the MEK. Well, on the 10th of May, 2004, we started the MEC Review Board. It concluded on the 4th of June. Yes, I have all these dates because I have all of the reports. Each individual was reviewed and an adjudication was made that there were no terrorists, not even wanted criminals among the 3,400 individuals. So the other governmental agencies departed, leaving it to the U.S. Army, specifically a reserve unit out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the 336 MP battalion that worked for me. I was a commander at 89th MP Brigade. This job was passed from MP unit to MP unit, culminating with the departure of U.S. forces in 2009 from Camp Ashraf. During that time, the military police are proud to report there were no deaths or serious injuries of any member of the MEK. They were turned over to the Iraqis for protection. Their tally's a little bit different almost 50 deaths and hundreds wounded. Interesting figures for a protection mission. Okay, anyway, that's not the real focus of what I want to talk about. That's what keeps me up at night. The most troublesome current issue is the factually incorrect assertions made by the government attorney last week at the court hearing on the writ of mandamus. The attorney stated in court that we, referring to the U.S., have never completely searched the entirety of Camp Ashraf, therefore they may still have a means to harm the United States. You ever been in the middle of Diyala? It is a long ways from the, middle of, from the United States. Also, he added that the MEK never gave us open access to the entire camp. I take great offense to those comments because of the dedication and hard work done over a year-long period from 2003 to the end of 2004, where my forces conducted operations, inspections, raids to find any contraband, looking for weapons, explosives, other armaments, possibly hidden someplace on this facility and around the facility. We didn't stay confined to the facility. First, we had open access everywhere at any time, any place. Look at it. If somebody would have prevented us access, it would have been a very bad day for them. We asserted ourselves. We chose locations and went to them. No place was off limits. And the reason that we never had an altercation is because no doors were closed or locked to us. We went where we wanted to go. We saw what we wanted to see. Now for the attorney's assertion that there may be still uh, weapons hidden someplace on the camp because we've never fully searched because it's a big area. To that I say, what do you mean we didn't search? I personally 
was to every single facility on that 36 square kilometer facility. This is my aerial photography that has every building and it is a detailed shot to where I could even see tracks in the dirt when I would blow it up. So if there was any movement of the ground, we would inspect it to make sure weapons had not been buried there the night before. I went to the morgue, inspected there, to the hospitals, to the latrines. Every place was inspected on that camp. There's also an assertion that the camp's not fenced in. I don't know, it could have fooled me. It's a 12-foot fence all the way around, six kilometers by six kilometers, concertina wire up on top. Sounds like a fence to me. We used high-tech methods looking for weapons. And we used some good old-fashioned boots on the ground. We did find bayonets. In the female billets, in their wall lockers, next to their personal clothing, was a bayonet. I let them keep the bayonets. We did clear thousands of deadly bomblet bomblets. We demilitarized over 100 bunkers filled with ammunition and thoroughly checked every square meter of the 36 square uh, kilometer facility. I didn't read a report about this. I didn't look at an intel action about it. I did it. I walked the ground. I've been to the facilities. I inspected every instruction on a camp. It's not hearsay. First hand, I was there. I can tell you no rock was unturned. We did have open access to the entirety of that camp and never did we find a single weapon. No, there's another side to this too. I wanted to find weapons, remember? I'm a soldier. I was given a mission to guard 3,400 de uh, detainees who were terrorists. I believed they were terrorists when I took over that mission. So by God, I was going to find the smoking gun. I was going to prove why we were in the middle of the Diala Desert in 45 degrees Celsius. Add that up. It's pretty hot over there in the summer looking for contraband. Soldiers have a unique perspective on the world. And if you listen to them, it's amazing what you can learn. In my case, I traveled with a 12 soldier security detail of four up-armored Humvees. We traveled the entire country, rebuilding the Iraqi police, keeping the high-value detainees, and yes, guarding Saddam Hussein. That was our job. We had another job of detaining and protecting the 3,400 people at Camp Ashraf. Well, my soldiers would ask, real subtly, Sir, when are we going back to Ashraf? You know why they asked that? Because on Ashraf, in the midst of 3,400 terrorists, they felt safe. In fact, it was the safest place my soldiers were in that country. I walked, talked, spent time with, usually unarmed, with the so-called hardcore, the government attorney's term, not mine, hardcore members of the MEK. I don't call them hardcore members. I knew them, the people. Few people know these hardcore members better than me. So did they have weapons hidden on Camp Ashraf? No. And think about it. I staked my life on it. Ashraf was the safest place in Iraq. Thank you.